So, Tana, let's see if this information is correct. Where are you from? I'm from Berlin, but my parents are from Ankara in Turkey. Berlin, okay. And how old are you? I'm 14. And when's your birthday? It's the 17th of November. Ah, okay. What languages do you speak? I speak German, a little English, and I can speak Turkish too. Okay. Have you got any brothers and sisters? I've got a brother and a sister. Ada's eleven and Deniz is eight. How do you spell Deniz? D E N I Z. It's Turkish. Okay. What's your favorite subject at school? It's art. I love drawing. Cool. Okay, and what's your favorite food? Mm, I like chicken, but I don't like vegetables. Okay, and what kind of music do you like? I like rap and hip hop. And your favorite color? Blue. Who's your favorite actor or singer? My favorite actor is Tom Holland. He plays Spider Man. And what do you do in your free time? Um, I like listening to music, playing computer games, and hanging out with friends. Right, now it's my turn to ask you questions. Hello? You're calling Radio West. What's your name? Hi, I'm Cole. So, Cole, can you answer the questions in today's quiz? Um, I think so. Okay, well, let's see. The first question, how many languages are there in the world? Is it... 7,000? That's correct! Well done, Cole! Next question. What is the most common language? Well, I know that there are a lot of Chinese people in the world, so... I think it's Chinese. Correct again! Over a billion people speak Mandarin Chinese. That's a lot of people. Okay, now, who invented Elvish? Oh, I'm a fan of the Lord of the Rings, so I know this one. It's Tolkien. Good job, Cole. That's three out of three. Next question. In which of the places in the quiz are there 500 words for rain? Hmm, this is difficult. I know that there's a lot of rain in India, so I'm going to say Morsinram. <laughs> Sorry, Cole. The correct answer is Hawaii. Bad luck. Next question. What's the special language on Gomera? Ah, uh, I went there on holiday, so I know this one. They whistle. That's correct. Let's listen to a bit. Incredible, right? Okay, question six. Where can you hear Chalkatong Mixtec? I'm not sure, but 
the name sounds Mexican to me, so I think it's Mexico. That's correct. Six thousand people speak this language in a Mexican village. And last question, Cole. When is International Language Day? Is it the sixth of June? <coughs> Sorry, it's the twenty-first of February. Well, that's five out of seven. Not bad. Thanks for calling, Cole. Now for some music. Screen time, screen tastic. Some adults say that teens are always in front of a computer screen or playing games on a console. But what about the positive side to technology? In today's Tech Master post, we meet four people who use modern tech. To get super creative, Zachary Maxwell is a teenager from New York. He describes himself as shy, but he has meetings with politicians. Why do they meet him? Because of his videos. Zachary made his first documentary. When he was eight, he often uses his films to raise awareness about problems in his school or neighborhood. Zach uses a camera to make his films, but don't worry if you don't have one. With a phone, anyone can become a filmmaker today. The app Musically, now called TikTok, helped 16-year-old twins Lisa and Lena Mantler from Germany to become social media superstars. The sisters spend 20 minutes a day making videos to post on the app, and now have over 16 million followers. When he was 16, David Eisman started Pixelman Productions. David doesn't write programs; he organizes the team. They're working on their first game, Merca. If you're into video games, why not make one yourself? At MakeVideoGames.com. There are lots of tutorials and programs to help you make an awesome strategy game. I normally upload a video on TikTok once a week, but I'm not as good as Lisa and Lena. No problem, Zoe. The important thing is having fun. I use an app called Animaker. To make cartoons. Great, Ross. Thanks for sharing. My local art center has a filmmaking club three times a month. Yes, art centers can be good places to get help and ideas. Hi, I'm Logan Bell. And today I'm visiting the Leeds City Library. I'm here to find out about their activities program. So, let's talk to a few people. Hi, what's your name? Annabelle. I can see you aren't reading. What are you doing here? We're making a video. A video? Yeah. It's like review of a book. People usually read reviews. I know, but we make films. We don't talk about the books. 
we act out parts of the story. We post the videos online and people watch them when they're deciding what to read. So you're into books? Yeah. I read anything except horror stories. And I'm mad about making films too. I come here twice a week. It's really good fun. Okay, thanks. What about you two? What are your names? I'm Noah. And I'm Josh. What are you doing? This is the writing workshop. We're using these computer programs to get ideas. I'm using Flickr. It gives you five photos and then you write a story about them. And I'm using Google Maps to find a place to write about. How often do you come here? Once a week. We want to be journalists or writers. And are you keen on reading too? Yeah. Some people think it isn't cool, but we read a lot. We like all kinds of books, but we're big fans of science fiction. Okay, thanks. So, there are some great things happening here. Why don't you come and see? That's all from me for now. See you next week. How the Aztecs changed the world. We live in a time of advanced technology, and we often think of ancient civilizations as primitive. It's easy to forget that they invented many amazing things. One of these civilizations was the Aztec Empire. When the early Aztecs arrived in the Valley of Mexico in around A.D. 1250, they decided to live on an island in Lake Texcoco. There wasn't much land, so they created artificial islands and built on these. With time, the capital city, Tenochtitlan, became larger than Rome. There were pyramids, shops, and homes, all connected with canals and boats. As there were more and more people in the city, the Aztecs needed more food. They couldn't grow vegetables in the water, so they created special floating gardens on the water. And because the water in the lake wasn't good for drinking, they built aqueducts to bring fresh water to homes. Boys and girls, both rich and poor, went to school in the Aztec Empire. The Aztecs knew that they needed skilled workers, so they were the first to start a system of free education. Everyone learned good behavior, but clever students could become engineers, scientists, artists, or doctors. The Aztecs also created two calendars, one for festivals and the other for counting days. The second calendar had 365 days and 18 months, each with 20 days. There were five extra days that the Aztecs thought were unlucky, and on these days, they usually stayed at home. More than a million people still speak Nahua, 
the modern Aztec language. People still play a type of drum invented by the Aztecs. And many Mexican recipes use ingredients from Aztec times. The Aztec Empire disappeared hundreds of years ago, but we can see its influence today. School life in ancient Egypt. In some ways, schools in ancient Egypt were very similar to schools today. There were tables and chairs in the classrooms, and there was a type of paper called papyrus, so students could write. They wrote using hieroglyphic symbols. There were about seven hundred symbols in the Egyptian alphabet, but most teenagers didn't go to school because education wasn't free. Only the sons of rich families could study. Girls usually helped at home, and most of them couldn't read or write. Good morning. Today on History Now, I'm talking about the First Nations with expert Dr. Rona Campbell. Dr. Campbell, what are the First Nations? The First Nations is the name for over six hundred groups of indigenous people, some of the first people in Canada. Interesting. So, where do First Nations people live today? They live all over Canada. One example is the Haida, who live on islands in British Columbia. I see. So, how many Haida are there today? About four thousand five hundred on the islands and in other parts of Canada. But there were a lot more Haida in the past. Really, how many Haida were there? Well, in the nineteenth century, there used to be about thirty thousand. But when Europeans brought new illnesses to the islands, people got ill and the population fell. In nineteen hundred, there were only six hundred Haida on the islands. That's terrible. And how did the Haida live in the past? Well, family and tradition are very important for the Haida. There were two important groups, and when they got married, people always married someone from the other group. Also, people didn't used to live in individual houses. Up to fifty people lived in one big longhouse. I see. And is there a Haida language? Yes, but unfortunately, the language is in real danger. In the past, everyone used to learn Haida when they were growing up, but now there are only twenty speakers. And most of them are over the age of seventy-five. But people didn't want the language to disappear, so now they teach Haida to children when they start school. And in 2017, they made the first Haida language film. That's great news. Now, tell me about. How it all started, the story of three brands. Instagram founders Kevin Systrom and Mike Krieger originally launched their app as Bourbon. When it proved too complicated for many users, they decided to make the app much simpler. Take a nice photo. Share it with your friends. Comment on other people's photos. 
It was an instant success. On the 6th of October 2010, 25,000 people downloaded it in 24 hours. Instagram became popular really fast, but the team was very small. Just 13 people were working for Instagram when Mark Zuckerberg bought the company in 2012. For one billion dollars. Systrom and Krieger made a lot of money, and both men are very rich today. The Van Doren brothers started the Vans Company in 1966, and their shoes were soon very popular with skateboarders. Before long, people were wearing Vans as a fashion shoe as well as for sport. The company had some financial problems in the 1980s, but soon it was doing much better. Now they make boots for snowboarders, sponsor sports competitions, and organize an annual art competition. For high school students, it's a company that also tries to make a difference, with environmentally friendly offices and community projects. Edwin Land first had the idea of instant photography when he was traveling with his daughter in 1943. And the first Polaroid Land camera went on sale in 1948. They became really popular in the 1960s and 70s. But when people started to use digital cameras, the Polaroid company had a very hard time. People weren't taking photos in the same way. Today, it's a different story. Retro things are popular again, and today people are buying instant cameras to use at weddings and parties. Okay, thank you. That was great. Now let's see, Charlie. I think it's your turn next. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to talk about these girls. They're members of a robotics team from Afghanistan. They're all between fourteen and sixteen years old, and I think they're amazing. So, a few years ago. These girls wanted to go to Washington for a robotics competition. They didn't have any materials in Afghanistan to make a robot, so they bought them online from another country. But the materials didn't arrive. While they were waiting, they tried to make a robot with things from home. But they just couldn't do it. In the end, they got the materials two weeks before the competition. Other teams had four months to build their robots. <laughs> But that wasn't the only problem. To go to Washington. The girls needed to get a visa from the U.S. Embassy in Kabul. They travelled 500 miles to the capital, Kabul, twice. Both times, the embassy said no. Luckily, the American president heard about their story and helped. So. The girls went to Washington. Then, 
On the day of the competition, they were practicing with their robot when it broke. What did the girls do? They quickly repaired the robot and competed as normal. So, you're probably thinking, after all this, did the girls win the competition? The answer is no. But they won a special prize for their achievement. For me, it shows that winning isn't the most important thing. One girl said she learned a lot while she was staying in the US and she met lots of people. It was a great achievement for them just to compete. So, that's it. Money for your old things. Do you keep old toys and technology? Have you got too many games? If the answer is yes, try selling them online. You could make some money. Most of us have got some Lego at home. Now people pay a lot of money for just one piece. There's a website called www.bricklink.com where you can sell your old Lego pieces. A normal piece, if it's the right colour, can sell for $200. And a red Darth Vader helmet sells for $400. There aren't many original Star Wars Millennium Falcon sets in the world, so one of these is worth $12,000. Did you used to collect Happy Meals toys? They're free when you buy a Happy Meal at McDonald's. Someone recently paid $360 for a set of the Minions and one Pikachu from a Japanese Happy Meal sold for $100. If you haven't got a complete set, don't worry, you can still get about $500 for a box of mixed toys. Maybe you've got some old boxes of cereal too. There were cereals for every film character and video game in the 80s and 90s. And Nintendo cereals were especially popular. A collector recently paid $200 for a box of these cereals and someone paid half that for an empty box. Nowadays, people change their phone every year or two, so you've probably got one of these. It isn't worth much now. But don't throw it away. It could be valuable in the future. A 1983 Motorola recently sold for $550 and other old phones are worth the same. So, if you want to buy new things and you haven't got enough money, go and look in your cupboard. Maybe you'll find some treasure there. Things today are becoming more expensive. So many people think it's better to share skills than to pay for things. But today we hear about a program that is trying to connect people with different skills and also connect older and younger people. With me today are Cynthia Jackson, founder of Generation Skillshare, 
and two people who use the service. 83-year-old Hazel Clark and Lewis Freeman, who's 22. First, Cynthia. Why did you start this service? Good morning. Well, I had the idea about two years ago. At the time, I was giving French classes to a neighbour and he was repairing my car. I was telling my dad, who's 80, about it. Um, and dad said, that's a great idea. Maybe there's someone who can help me use my computer. And that was it. I knew that skill sharing would work amazingly with two people from different generations. OK. Well, let's move on to two people who use the service. First, Hazel. Why do you use Generation Skillshare? Well, I'm 83, and to be honest, I was a bit frightened of new technology. I can understand that. Me too. Yes, but it's actually not as difficult as I thought. Lewis is very kind. He helped me understand my mobile phone, and now he's teaching me how to use an iPad. Before this, I went to a class, and the teacher explained things too quickly for me. I'm happier with Lewis. For someone my age, this is the easiest way to learn. What about you, Lewis? Well, I live on my own and I used to cook really badly. I had no idea. But Hazel's the best teacher I know. She explains everything very clearly and she never goes too fast. That's definitely something my generation can learn from older people. And now I can cook. OK. So, Cynthia, here we have two people. Print your own home. Building a house is often a very long and expensive job. But this might change in the next few years. The reason? 3D printing. How did 3D printing start? American engineer Chuck Hull introduced 3D printing in 1986. Now, we can build many different things using 3D technology, including bridges and buildings. What are the advantages of building with 3D printing. It's quick. In Russia, they built one house in just 24 hours. This means it's a very good way to build houses to help people in an emergency situation. It's more environmentally friendly. You can make 3D houses from recycled materials. It's cheap. Chinese company Winson says 3D houses use 60% fewer materials and 70% less time than traditional buildings. It's strong. 3D houses are better in a strong wind than many normal houses. What's happening in the Netherlands? In the Netherlands, the architects at Van Wijnen are working on what they say are the first 3D printed houses that people will actually be able to live in. The houses will have unusual shapes. The first house 
will be on one floor. It won't have any stairs. The other houses will be bigger, with more floors and several bedrooms. If everything goes to plan, people will move into the houses next year. Many people think this will completely change the way we build houses. How will 3D printing change things in the future? In the future, people will be able to design their own personalized homes much more cheaply. And some organizations, like Charity New Story, think 3D printing might help with housing problems in the developing world. But 3D technology could also be important in space. The European Space Agency is working on a 3D printed space station, and NASA are planning to use 3D technology to build on Mars. Meet Jenk, the founder of iCoolKid. Jenk Oz is a tech entrepreneur. He's met a lot of celebrities, including Adele. He's appeared in documentaries and music videos, and he's acted in a play in a London theatre. The amazing thing is, he's still a teenager. Jenk's company, a digital platform called iCoolKid, is a guide to all things cool to see and do. It's designed for 8 to 15 year olds and focuses on pop culture, tech and events. It has stories on everything from baking a cake with a 3D printer to doing a bungee jump on skis. You can even sing karaoke there. Jenk describes it as a place for young people to hang out and never get bored. The idea for the site came to Jenk when he was eight. Every Monday morning, his teacher asked about their weekend. He realised that he always did different things from his classmates. They sometimes saw a football or rugby match, but he went to musicals or other different events. His friends started to ask, Can I come with you? Jenk's mother decided to send them an email every week with ideas about what to do. Jenk presented the email as a school project, and the website grew from there. Jenk's own hobbies are a big part of his research. In his free time, he records music and takes dance classes. He sings and plays four musical instruments well. He loves extreme sports. He's been go-karting and skydiving. He's a big fan of fashion, too. Jenk hasn't written all the stories on his site. He has a team who help him, but he decides what's cool. And he's got big plans for the future. I Cool Kid has between 1,000 and 2,000 hits a day, and he wants to increase that to a million. He also plans to go global and write articles for people around the world. Why not check out iCoolKid.com and find out about events near you? Hey, Zach. What are you looking at? Oh, hi, Lily. My mum asked me to think of a present for my dad. It's his 50th birthday next month. Hmm, let's see. What sort of thing does he like? Sports? Clothes? 
No way. He hates all sports, especially football. And he just doesn't care about clothes. My mum hates it. So, what does he like? Well, he's into music. I mean, he plays the guitar and he used to be in a band. Maybe something musical then? Have you ever given him an experience box? No, I haven't. What's an experience box? I've never heard of it. So you give the person a box and a special ticket and then they go online to the website and choose something they'd like to do. Here, we can take a look. OK. Experience gifts. Music. Oh, there are lots. This one sounds good. Can you click on it? The musical experience. Let's see. Be a DJ for a day. Learn to mix like a professional. Would he like that? Mm, I don't think so. He's more into jazz. What else have they got? This one sounds good. Record your own song with a professional sound engineer. Has he ever been to a recording studio? No, never. That sounds like a good idea. I think he'd be into that. Oh, what's this one? Improve your technique in a guitar masterclass with a professional jazz musician. Wow, he'd love that. OK, so there are a couple of options he'd like. And there's more things lower down the page. Why don't you show your mum and see what she thinks? Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Lily. Nice one. A new way to collect. Collecting has been a popular hobby for many years, and people collect everything from comics and coins to pencils and postcards. But now some people are collecting in a different way, with a virtual collection. We find out why. A museum anyone can visit. The British Museum is one of London's most popular attractions, and nearly six million people visit it every year. But what if you can't get to London? No problem. With the Museum of the World project, the British Museum has worked with Google to create an amazing interactive experience. You can choose a continent or a moment in history and go back to see everything from ancient Egyptian shoes to an Aztec knife. They have objects from 2 million BC right up to the present day. It's free and it doesn't matter where you live. This is a museum for everyone. Collecting things on your computer. In 2017, gaming fans quickly went crazy for a new type of game, Crypto Kitties. In this game, People make virtual cats. They decide on the body, coloring, and characteristics they want and then buy and sell them online. Crypto Kitties has been a huge hit. Since 2017, players have spent the equivalent of around $30 million. 
one crypto kitty sold for a hundred and forty thousand dollars. Collecting things that you mustn't take with you. In the early part of the twentieth century, when people collected butterflies, they used to catch them, kill them, and then put them in a special box. Today, that sounds like a very cruel hobby. But that doesn't mean you can't collect butterflies. Doug Tarran has had a butterfly collection since he was seven, but now he collects them virtually. He still finds butterflies in their habitat and keeps information about them, but now he collects photographs, not butterflies. My grandmother is eighty, but she's still active. Tanya likes helping people. She's the most helpful person I know. There are lots of cars on our street. It's always noisy. I buy clothes that I love, not just what's fashionable. Rafa loves painting and drawing. He's very artistic. I often worry about exams. I find them really stressful. We were the last people to get tickets for the concert, so we were lucky. My sister goes swimming and running. She's very athletic. Greg always has good ideas. He's so imaginative. I usually wear trainers because they're comfortable. Now most of us have got lots of possessions, and we think we can't live without them. Well, Ryan Jackson is what we call a minimalist. He decided to donate nearly all his things to charity. He's here to tell us all about it. Ryan, how long have you been a minimalist? I suppose I've been a minimalist for about three years now. And how did it start? Well, it was the end of the school year, and I wanted to tidy my room because it was messy. Right. So, I took everything out of my wardrobe and off my shelves, and I thought, why do I have all this stuff? So. I put back the things that I needed, and I sold the rest on the internet or gave it to charity. How did you decide what to keep? Well, I kept clothes like T-shirts and jeans, and some comics that I've had since I was a kid. I took photos of other things like my old teddy bear and toys, and then gave them away. So you took photos first. Yeah, I mean, we've got everything on our phones or iPads now: books, photos, music. We don't need material things. And do you think you're happier now? Yeah, I do. I think a lot of people want things, and when they have them, they want more, and that's very stressful. I have more money now to travel or go to concerts, to do things that I find enjoyable. Do you have any advice for people who want to live like you? Yes, take everything you've got and think about what's useful. If something isn't useful, put it in a box. If you don't take it out of the box for a month, that means you can live without it. Have you ever thrown away something and then thought, "Oh no, I needed that"? Uh, 
once or twice, my skates, a book for school, but you can always borrow things. All right, thanks, Ryan. And now we're going to find out how other. Do girls have to do more jobs at home? Sarah is ten years old. Every morning, she wakes up early and bakes bread for her family's breakfast before she goes to school. Her fourteen-year-old sister Najma spends five hours a week washing the family's clothes. Sarah and Najma live in Somalia. But they're typical of many girls around the world. According to a report by UNICEF, girls around the world between the ages of five and fourteen spend forty percent more time helping at home than their brothers. In total, they do five hundred and fifty million hours of housework a day. That's one hundred and sixty million more hours than boys. Girls aged between five and nine spend an average of four hours a week on housework, while older girls spend about nine hours. In some countries, these numbers are even higher. In Somalia, for example, a girl between the ages of ten and fourteen sometimes has to spend twenty-six hours a week helping at home. The girls mainly help with cooking and cleaning. They also go shopping. And look after their younger brothers and sisters. In some countries, they also do heavy and dangerous jobs, such as collecting water and wood for making fire. As a result, the report says, girls often don't have the same opportunities in life as boys. While their brothers are playing football outside, they have to sweep the floors. They don't have time to play, spend time with friends, or to study. The report focuses on developing countries, but there is a similar tendency in other parts of the world. A study by the University of Maryland in the USA found that boys don't have to do as much housework as their sisters. On average, they spend about half an hour each day helping at home, compared to forty-five minutes for girls. The situation is improving. Boys do more jobs around the home now than they did in the past, but parents should make sure that children share housework equally. After all, doing housework can teach both boys and girls about responsibility, and this can help them at school and later at work. Okay. Good evening, everyone. I hope you're enjoying the open day. I'm Mrs. Reed, the head of Year Nine. Now you've heard about the different subjects you can study here at Camworth High, and later on, Mrs. Lopez is going to tell you about our sports program. But first, I'm going to talk about another exciting aspect of life in the school. If you have any questions, please ask. Now, Camworth High 
is not just about studying and having fun. We also want our students to learn about responsibility, both inside the school and in the local community. Many of our students say this is one of the most interesting and satisfying things they do here. Yes, do you have a question? Are you going to tell us about working in the forest park? Yes, I'll tell you about that in just a minute. Now, inside the school, we organise regular competitions and events to raise money for charity, and we also have a prefect system. What sort of events do you have? Well, last year, the prefects organised a quiz night. We had an end-of-year party. Oh, and a very exciting teachers versus students football competition. The students won, by the way. <laughs> this year, older students are running a food bank. That's collecting food for people who need it. And we also have a green group who organise recycling in the school. Um, yes, at the back. What sort of things do pupils do outside the school? To answer the question you asked earlier, for the last three years, we've had a project in Camworth Forest Park. Students in Year 8 have to spend three Saturdays a year working to protect wildlife in the forest. And in Year 9, students lead visits for younger children. Our students also visit some of the residents at Maidment Court, an old people's home near Camworth Park. You might find it challenging, but that's the good thing about it. You learn to do things you didn't think you could do before. Now I'm going to tell you about the school orchestra. Swimming with dolphins or buying the latest phone. What's worth more to you? Experiences or money? Some people say if you have money, you can buy the things you want. Others think experiences are better. Things break or get old. But memories of our experiences stay with us. In a recent survey, 22,000 participants in five continents were asked if they agreed or disagreed that experiences are more important than possessions. And in Mexico, the highest proportion, 57%, agreed. 3D printing saves lives. We all know that the research into 3D printing is going to change things in the future. People are already using it to make houses, cars and shoes. But hospital teams are also using 3D printing. Doctors in Gurgaon, India, recently saved the life of a young teacher using 3D technology. They made three artificial bones for her back and after just 10 days, the woman could walk again. Engineers today discover work from the past. Work on a new metro line in Rome has given engineers opportunities to find many interesting and valuable historical objects 30 metres down. 16th century plates, a 2nd century building and even part of Rome's first university 
are a few of the things they have discovered. Plastic or prison? Plastic bags are not environmentally friendly. On average, we use them for only 12 minutes, but they kill about 100,000 marine animals every year. It's no surprise that 32 countries, a lot of them in the developing world, have decided to ban plastic bags completely. In Kenya, people who make, sell or import plastic bags can go to prison for up to four years. The Monroe Museum of Computer History is open on Wednesday, Thursday, Saturday and Sunday from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. and on Friday from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. For school visits and workshops, please visit our website at monroemuseum.org slash education. The price for admission is $17.50 or $27.50 for two days. The museum is free for children under the age of 10. One of my favourite shops is Forever 21. So I wanted to find out how it started. In 1981, Don Chang and his wife Jin Suk Chang moved from South Korea to Los Angeles. They didn't have much money and they couldn't speak English at the time. Don was working at a petrol station when he saw that people with big cars often worked in fashion. The couple opened their first clothes shop in 1984 and then another and another. Now they've got hundreds. Experts say that in 2050, the population of the Earth will be 9 billion. Today, I'm visiting a farm right in the middle of the city to see how we can produce enough food for all these people. Hi there, what are you doing? Hi, I'm planting tomatoes. And why are you here? Well, there are lots of areas in the city that people don't use. So, we're making gardens and planting vegetables on them. We used to plant... In today's episode of All About Hobbies, we're looking at collections. Lots of teenagers collect things like football cards or video games, but Tushar Lakampal has a different passion. Yes, this Indian teenager has got the largest collection of pencils in the world. He started collecting when he was three, and now he's got over 19,000. He's even got two green and gold pencils that used to be in Buckingham Palace. 5. So, what happens if you have to ask a question about something for school? There's nothing I can do. I have to give it to them before I go to bed. You're kidding. That's really strict. I know. I can't have my phone in my bedroom. Not even to listen to music. Really? I have to turn down the volume when we're having dinner, but I don't have to turn it off. 
Using the latest technology or recycled waste, people all over the world find ways to make music. We have two stories for you today. The first is about a virtual choir, and the second is about a trash orchestra. Toby is here to tell us about them. Hi, Toby. Hi there. So, the choir first. How does it work? Well, singers all over the world record a song, and then they upload the video to the internet. A guy called Eric Whitaker, an American composer, uses technology to put all the voices together to make one performance. How many singers are there? It's grown from one hundred and eighty-five singers to about eight thousand from over one hundred countries. And how did it start? Back in two thousand and nine, a girl, a fan of Whitaker, sang a song and sent the video to him, and he loved it. He wrote on his blog. And asked others to do the same. Then he had the idea of putting the voices together. And there's a youth choir too. That's right. Over two thousand singers from eighty countries sang together in Scotland in two thousand and fourteen. If you go online, you'll see the video. It's brilliant. Okay. And what about the second story? Well, this orchestra started back in two thousand and six. A guy called Nicolas Gomez from Cateura in Paraguay was looking for things to recycle when he had the idea of making musical instruments from waste. He made a violin from an old pizza tin and a fork and things like that, and invited people to play. Because people didn't have enough money to buy instruments, right? That's right. And they've had a lot of success. Yes, they've made albums and they've played in forty-four countries. They've even been on tour in South America with the band Metallica. That's an amazing experience. Yeah. The orchestra gave these young people the chance to learn to play an instrument and travel and see the world. And I think there are trash orchestras in other countries too now. Yes, in Mexico and Spain. You should go online and listen to them. Okay. Well, thanks, Toby. I'll do that. And that's all we have for you today. So.